it was almost impossible for you to walk down the tier and not really look in the cell. But if you looked in somebody's cell, that can cause you an eye. That can cause you to get stabbed. That can cause you to be in a beef just from looking in somebody's cell. But if you don't look, it can cause you your life because that could be a knife coming at you that can hit you. So it's a double-edged sword, you know. What are you gonna do? You you know, you gonna look and cause problems or you not gonna look and just hope and pray don't know about nothing happen to you. And you had to walk down this lawn till you might have to walk past 20, 30 sales. Brush strokes, cut throat from the low low when no love goes. Women buddy buddy like it's been dad. When a me looking at the bill stack off the bubbly buddy, I've been stressed out. Let the smoke scream from my chest out. Lay stuff, I really hate love from a stranger. Shit is fake stuff, only need it for you. We're gonna start a little different. What I want to start with, Banky, is you know, what has this experience been like for you beginning to share your story with us? Uh, it's been a good experience for me, man, because it's allowed me to get some of these things off my chest. A lot of these things I haven't really verbalized or, or talked about because it's something that you really hold internally inside you. You know what I'm saying? It's not nothing that you talk about every day because you lived it. You know, you'd be kind of surprised that people really want to know these things because it was everyday life for me. But for most people, it's not. So I can understand that they might be interested. And I like to be able to share my story anyway because my main goal is that somebody can hear what I went through, understand what I went through, and then they can better understand me. And then maybe they can get something out of it that might help them or might help them help someone else that may be getting ready to go on the same path that I went in because it's a path that you don't want to go down because once you start down it, like I say, trying to reverse it is, is very difficult. It's very difficult. So, you know, I just feel blessed, man, that I made it through. I feel blessed that I'm able to experience some of the things I'm experiencing now, to see some of the things I'm seeing now, things that I thought I might never see. So to be able to share that with people and, you know, hopefully people will understand it. Hopefully people will get something out of it that's positive because that's what I'm about, all about positivity, you know, because it's, I believe that happiness is a choice and it's a choice. You got to choose to be happy. You know, I can focus on all the bad stuff that happened to me. I can focus on what I feel like, it, you know, I was abandoned or I was, you know, mistreated, this, that. I can say all of that, but it ain't going to do me no good. So, you know, I just focus on the positive. Every day is a good day for me. Every day out here is going to be a good day for me. I lock that in my mind and I try to make that happen. I try to manifest that. You know, I try to manifest that every day to find some positivity, you know. And I know you've gotten a chance to see the video that we first filmed with you. You know, what was it like to be able to watch that video and see yourself sharing your story? Uh, that was shocking. That was shocking and amazing, you know what I'm saying? I had a seen myself on video before boxing, but I had never, you know, seen myself on video just talking. So uh, that was shocking, you know. And um, I remember when it first popped up on the screen, I was like, wow, that's crazy, I'm, I'm on TV. You know, so it, that was really shocking to me. And then other people to see it and tell me about it and tell me what they thought about it, you know, it kind of made me feel, you know, like I was doing something good or I did something that I could be proud of. And that's what you want to do because you want to turn your situation around. You want to put some positivity in your life. You want to do something that's productive. You don't want to be remembered for someone who just did a lot of time. Oh, he was locked up this amount of time, X amount of time, or this, that, and the You don't want to be defined by anything. You want to try to keep redefining yourself every day. You know what I'm saying? To try to be better every day, to try to go forward every day. So I, I enjoyed it, man, and it was an experience. I watched it myself a couple of times, you know. I think my voice sounded kind of funny, but, you know, that's that's just like what it is. But, yeah, it looks, it looks weird when you watch yourself on the screen. You know, I want to let you know that you've done exceptional with never being in front of the camera like this before. You have just been like a natural with this. And people are really resonating with you, with your story, and with what you've been through. And I know you haven't gotten a chance personally to see comments that are being left on this video, but you've heard from me and also from your family that, you know, like 90 plus percent of these comments are positive, encouraging comments left about you you know how does that make you feel that people are so receptive of hearing what you've been through 
Oh, it makes me feel good, you know, because like I say, a lot of times people don't understand what you've been through. They just heard from the outside. And perfection is impossible. Perfection is is perception. It's people perception what they what they consider to be perfection. There's nothing gonna be perfect. No one's gonna have a perfect life. Everybody's gonna make mistakes. Everybody is gonna fall. And that's what I say. You just how you pick yourself up. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be able to pick yourself up and keep on going. I can look at something and think it's perfect and somebody else can look at something and think it's trash. You know, so it's all the, in the perception. And the, the way I look at it, if people can get something out of it positive and understand it, I went through a whole lot of things that I probably didn't have to go through and I understand it. Most of it was because of my own doing. You know, there's a quote from a uh, dude named George Jackson that I always lean back on where he says that 85% of a man's sorrow in life is gonna come from being self-imposed by failing to act and analyze in a critical situation. And I believe that. 85% of your own sorrow is gonna become, it's gonna come from you not doing what you're supposed to do at the time you were supposed to do it. You going left when you should've went right. You know, the rest of it is just happenstance. 15% of it is just gonna happen anyway. Everybody's gonna have that in life. But you can greatly cut down your misery and your sorrow by thinking of a situation out before you act. You know, think about what you do instead of doing what you think. And that's what I try to live by today. If I would have knew these things back then, I would be in a different position, you know, but I didn't. So I had to learn the hard way. And then some people learn it early, some people don't. That's just the road that I had to, I had to, I had to walk. That's why I say I'm not gonna complain and I'm not gonna cry because it is what it is. You know, if I had stayed in there 40 years, 50 years, that just would have been my cross to bear. That's just what it, what it had to be because of my own actions. And I take full responsibility for that, you know, but I hope somebody can get something out of it because it can help them not go through that, you know. And most people that may be watching, they may be grown or whatever, but they may can set their son down there and watch it, their teenager down there and watch it, and let them know that it is not a road that they want to travel. Because a lot of these dudes out here right now, I look at them and I look at the news and I see the things they doing and the gangs and all the stuff they into and they thinking they, they thorough and they thinking they a gangster. It ain't gonna be like that in there. I can promise you that. I don't care who you think you are or what you think you're doing out here. Ain't going to be like that in there. Ain't no guns. Ain't nobody coming to save you. It ain't none of that in there. And they don't care who you are and what you did and what your reputation. None of that. So you better start thinking and understand what freedom is if you out here acting a fool or if you know somebody that's, that you can reach and tell them you need to stop them because prison getting worse every day and they just got beds open all the time. So there's always somebody there waiting for you, you know? So I try to just talk to people that they can understand that, you know what I'm saying? Because I got nephews, I got cousins this young. I got a lot of people that has young kids. And like I say, if somebody would have told me, you know, and I'm not saying that I didn't know because I'm, I, I, I take responsibility. You know when you do something wrong, this is going to be repercussions behind, but you don't know all the time what the repercussions are. You have to know that. That's what people is not giving out that type of information. You got to let people know, look, if you do this, this and that can happen. But a lot of people don't know that. They know you can get in trouble, but do they know the extent that you can get in trouble? I think that makes a lot of difference because if you knew what you was facing, then maybe it would deter you from doing some of the things you do. But a lot of information is not being geared to kids. They tell kids, look, don't do this, don't do that. Why? Because I say so. Nah, explain it to them. Make them know why they shouldn't do it. Make them know what can happen to them if they do do it. I think if they knew that, it would change a lot of their decision makers. And then a lot of times they listen to people on the street because they can't talk to their parents. You got to be able to talk to your kids. You know, you got to be able to talk to them and explain these things to them because if you let them listen to people out on the street, that's another saying that I live by. You listen to their friends out on the street, they be misinformed. And misinformed people misinform people. So that's that's a real statement. It's simple, and it's, but it's true. Misinformed people misinform people. And you only know what you know. And you're not gonna know anything else until you experience something else. But when you listen to somebody giving you bad information, and that's what you're gonna roll on. So it's up to us to get the people that we love good information. So that's why I say, if I can get anything out of this, it's just to make somebody understand that all the choices you make in life, you're gonna be judged by. Now what you don't want to do is be judged by for the rest of your life, because like I say, 
I don't think any one act that anybody does should define their whole life. Because you can fall today and you can get up tomorrow. You can be a bum today and you can be a millionaire next year. It all depends on what your drive is and how much you got inside you. And I just believe in that. I just believe that I can always make myself better if I'm still breathing. The only time you can't make yourself better if you stop breathing. As long as I'm still breathing, I'm going to keep striving to be better every day. Every day. You know, to listen to you talk and to think about the amount of time that you've gone through, it's just almost unbelievable to hear how positive, how driven, and how level-headed you are given some of, if not a whole lot of what you experienced throughout the three decades that you spent in prison. And with mentioning that, you know, I do want to go back to where we left off in the first video. We left off there with you arriving at a notoriously violent prison here in the state of Virginia called The Wall. And while there, you ended up obtaining a knife for yourself that you wanted for protection. You mentioned this knife looked like a Rambo knife, and you were worried thinking about what other type of weapons could potentially be in there if you were able to get what you got. You know, Banky, talk to us about how your time at the wall would be and what would end up leading to you leaving from that prison. Well, when I got that knife, you know, like I said, I felt more secure, you know, and then, like I said, the reality set in that if I got this, you know, and I just got here, then I know it's worse out there or just the, even the equivalent to what I got. So, yeah, it, it, it was a... Uh, it was bittersweet, but at the same time, like I say, I would rather have it than not have it. And um, it was just a new life for me, man. I had never uh, just been in that environment and, you know, been in that type of surroundings where every day you just can smell danger. You can smell it, you know what I'm saying? And I know that may be hard for people to understand, but you will if you was in that environment. You can walk out of that cell. Every day I walked out of that cell, I knew without a shadow of a doubt Danger was out there. Death was out there. Trouble was out there. Anything you wanted, it was right there because that's the way the environment was. So I had, that took some getting used to because I had never been around that type of stuff. Even the places I had went already first, just in receiving and stuff like that, it was nothing like this. It was like each stage I went through was more graphic, and the wall was the, the epitome of that. So when I walk out there and I, I first go out and I see dudes and I'm looking at them, I see all different type of people, man, big dudes. I mean, when I say big, I mean real big. You know, I'm talking about muscles on top of muscles. You know, tall guys, small guys, everything you could think of that you've heard about or whatever, it was there, you know. And we all out there mingling and we got to fend for ourselves. There's no officer in sight. Opposed to these days and times now, you may have an officer on the floor almost everywhere you go for like, 60, 70 percent of the day, they in and out. Nah, not back then. Up there, nah, you ain't gonna see no officer when them doors open. It ain't gonna be nobody out there but just straight convicts. That also means that you by yourself. That you by yourself. You know, you ain't got your mama, you ain't got your daddy, you ain't got your homeboy, you ain't got nothing but yourself. And that's the only thing that's gonna keep you alive and that's the only thing that's gonna keep you safe. And so you have to change your whole mindset of how you gonna live and determine you know, what you gonna do. You don't know who to speak to. You don't know who's speaking to you if, if, if they got ulterior motives. And you know, coincidentally too, that's one of the first incidents that I got into for speaking to somebody and talking to somebody and not realizing that they was trying to run con, trying to run game on me. You know, so you don't know who you're talking to. You want to give everybody a fair shot. But in the environment that I was in, you got everybody in, in there. They predators, man. They praying on you. The dude that pulled up on me and was talking to me and asking me about buying some uh, sunshades. I was like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? He said, you try them on there, this, that, and third. They look good on you, whatever, whatever. I don't want but a certain amount of money for them. It wasn't that much. I remember it at the time. So I said, yeah, I got them. I get them from them, and I did. It's like three days later, another dude came up to me telling me that the glasses got stole out of his cell and he wanted them back. So I'm like, what? You know, it just was perplexed to me. But he was telling me like, man, where you get my, my stuff from, man, that belongs to me. Somebody stole out my cell, this, that, and the third. So I'm arguing with him about this. And lo and behold, later on down the line, at the time I was, I, I was, it was, I didn't even know, but they together, this is just a con. 
You know what I'm saying? This is something they running on me because I'm new in prison. So they really looking to extort me to looking to see how I'm built, looking to see if I'm going to stand up for myself, if I'm going to fight. Am I going to be, you know what I'm saying, a problem? Or am I going to be somebody to just lay down and they can just roll over, then start doing whatever they want to do to me? So my whole instincts kicked in and I was like, man, if he, if, if somebody stole him from your cell or whatever, then you need to go deal with them. I got him from somebody else. I don't even want to talk about it no more. So he started to get a little loud or whatever, whatever, and I got louder back. And and I was ready to fight, you know what I'm saying? So he he rolled out, he leave like it. And in prison, you start an argument and someone walks away, you don't know what's coming next, you know? And I was already smart enough to know that, you know? So I just had my knife and I was ready for whatever he wanted to do, but he didn't even come back and say anything else to me till after I was locked in my cell. That way he knew he had the bars in between us. And that was all intimidation tactics then. Then he trying to scare me. You know what I'm saying? But when he see I'm not scared, then he was like, boom, he just left the situation alone. So I didn't even know then, like I say, at the time when it's happening, I'm thinking this is all genuine, it's real. Somebody stole his stuff and he, you know, and he done sold it to me. So I'm looking for the other guy who sold it to me then. But all the time I later on, lay on they together. Those just little things that be happening in prison that, like I say, you could be minding your own business, doing your own thing. You have no problem with nobody. You're not looking for trouble. Trouble gonna find you. It's going to find you. And you know what I'm saying? That was my first real incident in there. And once that happened too, like I say, everything in there, it changes your mindset then because it puts you on guard for everything. You're always walking. You're always looking. You you walk close to a cell. You see people, they they stick knives out and stab you through the bars when you're walking. So you can't even do nothing to them because they're behind the bar. They tie knives on broomsticks and wait for you to walk down the tier. And you can't do nothing but walk past and they jab it out there and stab you. You have to worry about things like that. You know, you got bars on your, your cell. When you go to sleep and lay down at night, they can come and stab you if they out and you in their sleep. So it's just danger all around you all the time. It was almost impossible for you to walk down the tier and not really look in the cell. But if you looked in somebody's cell, that can cause you an eye. That can cause you to get stabbed. That can cause you to be in a beef just from looking in somebody's cell. But if you don't look, it can cost you your life because that could be a knife coming at you that can hit you. So it's a double-edged sword, you know. What are you going to do? You you know, you're going to look and cause problems or you're not going to look and just hope and pray don't know about nothing happen to you. And you had to walk down this long tier. You might have to walk past 20, 30 cells. You know, and the tiers are so narrow. And on one side, you got danger because you don't know what's coming out the cell. And on the other side, you got danger if you're on the third, second, third, or fourth tier. Because you can go over, and if you go over third or fourth tier, you, you're going to die or you're definitely going to the hospital and be fighting for your life. So these are the elements that you live in when you, when you was in the wall. These are the elements every day, you know what I'm saying? And like I told you, when I seen the dude get killed in there, he just laid there. And people walked around him and walked over him and walked past him. No one came in there to say, oh, help him up or get him up. Nah, because you know not to do that. If you would have went over there and even tried to help them, you might have got attacked yourself. So, like I say, it's just a crazy life, man. It was a real crazy life. And sometimes I look back at these situations and I ask myself, you know, how did I survive? How did I adjust to that? But that's just something that you do. It's, it's just, it's in your DNA, it's in your nature because your survival instincts kick in. This is what you got to do. And then the crazy part about it is, <laughs> You you had to literally tell yourself when you make it through a day like that and you haven't been used to that and you get through that stuff, you had to literally tell yourself, well, I got to do this again tomorrow and I got to do it again next week and I got to do it again next month and next year and for however many years you got ahead of you. And for me, I had, it was like infinite. So then you have to make it up in your mind, do you want to do this? You know, can you do this? You know what I'm saying? So those are questions you're going to have to answer when you're in that type of environment. And a lot of times I didn't even know if I could or even if I wanted to, especially first starting out because that's what's going through your mind. I can't live like this, man. There's no way I can live like this every day. And then when your luck going to run out, when somebody going to get you, you know, when somebody going to stab you, when you might lose an eye, you might get killed, or when you going to have to hurt somebody. It's a, it's a war in there every day, man. And it's a war to also keep your sanity, to keep your sanity, because that type of stuff can make you go insane. I, I, I was close a lot of times. 
a lot of times because it was nothing what I was used to. But I had to adapt quick and I had to do what I had to do in order to survive in there. Because one thing I do know, if you're in prison, it's a fact. This is a fact, not fiction. If you want to die, when you hear people say suicide, if you want to die in prison, it's the easiest thing to do. Easiest thing to do. There's so many ways you can die. You go mess with the wrong person and say some crazy, you're going to die that day. You're going to die that day. So if you want to die, if somebody in prison tell you they want to die, they they not tell you the truth. If you want to die, you can die. You go mess with them guards and do something you don't supposed to do or act like you're trying to attack them, they'll kill you. You go mess with the wrong person in there, they'll kill you. You go in somebody say and take something that don't belong to you, they'll kill you. So if you want to die, you can die. So everybody in there that's living, they want to live. And you got to find what makes you want to live. You know, what makes you want to get back out here in society, get back out here to the people that love you. That's what you got to latch on to. If you don't have that to latch on to, then it ain't nothing going on for you in there. How long would you end up staying at the wall? I think I stayed there. I know when I left, uh, I think I stayed there maybe two years, maybe two and a half, three years. I left because they was in, um, they was in renovation stage then. They were starting to double up the sales. And mind you, the sales were already little. They, that and Power Tan was probably the two smallest sales that I ever been in. And they was real little. But they was talking about putting another man in there with you. you know, so that is a whole other element in itself. You know, that's something that most people out here on the, in society can't understand. You know, when you have to live under those conditions, when you have to be in a room with another dude that's, that sell is probably eight by 10. It's probably the size of the average person with a regular home bathroom. And you got to be in there with another man and all day, every day. He used the bathroom in front of you, you used the bathroom in front of him. You know, you smell him, he smell you. That in itself alone is dehumanized, you know. And then when they feed, Sometimes they got to feed you in your cell. A lot of times, well, matter of fact, they fed you all the time in the wall in your cell when I was there. They was feeding in the cell. There was no kitchen. So they feeding you in your cell. So you eating in the same cell that you used the bathroom in. You know, this is how we live. You know, but they, they say we human, but they're not treating us like we human. You know, but this is the things that you have to get used to. This is the things that the average person that you ask them right here now in society to go sit in your bathroom and, and have lunch have dinner, and they think you crazy. But this is what we got to do every day in there. Every day, this is how we had to live. They started doubling up the bunks and doubling up the cells, and um, then they was talking about closing the whole place down. So I probably stayed in there maybe, probably about two months after they put a guy in my cell. So I was actually in a cell with a dude in the wall for about two months, African dude. And um, I stayed in there with him for about two months, and I got shipped, and I left there, and uh, I went to Augusta, yeah, which was a whole, a whole other element in itself. I was way, way up there in the mountains, and it was uh, super duper racist. I think they might have had like, when I was there, might have been open about f three to five years, and they might have had about, I don't know, fifteen, two thousand people worked there, probably. Five of them was, was African-American or any other race besides Caucasian. And uh, they let you know it, you know, and they let you know it. So that was something else that I had to adapt to. That's part of prison. That's why I feel like anybody that's been in prison for a long time, and I know a lot of people get out and go back, but like I say, I personally believe I don't judge nobody because, you know, don't judge nobody unless you want to be judged. But I just feel personally that you'll never have to go back because in prison you have, you learn to adapt and adjust to anything, anything. So when you get out of here in society and it's moving fast and it is moving fast, I can tell you that from being out here less than 90 days, but you have to slow it down within yourself and you have to learn to adapt and adjust to it. And I learned that in prison because I can be in one prison today and I'll be in another prison next week. Whenever they want to send you, because you, you like cattle, you go wherever they tell you to go. There's nothing you can do about it. You know what I'm saying? If they say pack your stuff today, you leaving tomorrow, or oh, you going. You going, even by force, but you are going. Yeah, I, I had to go up there, and I got up there in Augusta, man, and I had to adapt again. After I just got used to being in all of this chaos, 
I had to now deal with a whole nother chaos, you know, and learn this environment, learn what's going on here, learn how the dudes are here, how they're acting here, how the officers is acting here, how the warden is running this institution now. So these are all these things you have to learn every day is something different. But the one thing that remains constant in its prison is violence. Violence is always there. It's always there. That's what controls everything. And when you look at society, it's the same way. But people just don't look at it like that. You wouldn't listen to a cop if he didn't have a gun. You know what I'm saying? You wouldn't listen to the army if they didn't have tanks. You listen to them because they're using violence and they're using force. And sometimes they don't have to use it, but the threat is there. You know it's there. You see the gun on his hip. And in prison, you know that violence is there. So people respect that if they don't respect you. That's what I was saying at first. You may not respect the officer, but you do what he tell you to do because you know he has the authority. But furthermore, you know he has that violence behind him. We can see that with what's going on today. When you get in there, that's the main thing that you need to know. So with every prison you go to, you need to find out the level of what's going on there. So when I got to Augusta, I had to find out the level of what was going on there. And every prison you go to, when you get in there, you learn more as you go. Because like I say, when I went in the wall, I listened to the dude and I talked to him and engaged in conversation with him and bought the glasses or whatnot and ended up in what could have been a fatal confrontation. But... So now when I go to Augusta, I don't talk to nobody, you know, and people come up to me and try to talk to me. I don't talk to them because I don't know you, you know, and I don't want to get to know you. I have to get at a comfort level to see what's going on to see how people are here before I even start to engage in conversation. I would go in a cell with a cell partner and he right there with me every day and not talk to him because I don't know him. And we got to move around each other and maneuver around each other all day in an eight by 10 cell. So this is life in prison. So that's why I say when you in there, these are things that's every day that you have to deal with and you have to learn. So to come out of here and to be out here and have to to deal with all the changes, all the new stuff, yeah, it's, 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 it's a challenge. But it's way better than what you got to deal with in there. You had shared with me when I first began speaking with you of your time at Augusta. And I believe it was there where you had probably one of the more severe incidents or things happen during your time locked up, which could have led to any number of situations coming from that. But could you give us a little bit of the backstory that led up to this uh, situation where you almost almost killed a guy there, correct? Yeah, I, I had a confrontation with a guy up there, man. He was probably if not the biggest dude on the camp, was one of the biggest dudes on the camp. And um, yeah, for whatever reason, he had took a dislike to me. So every time I was around him, he would, he would say something negative to me or he would try to engage in confrontation with me. And this was later on down the line when I was at Augusta. You know, after I had been there a while, people know me, I'm established as, you know, who I am. And he just ain't like that. He didn't like the fact that I had respect and I was such a small guy and he was such a big guy. But I had just as much respect as he had, if not more. So he didn't like that and he took a dislike to me. I tried to avoid the confrontation with him as much as possible. Not so much the fact that he was such a big dude. It just was the fact that I know and I had knew by the end that Any confrontation was bad confrontation, you know. Any conversation was bad confrontation because you're going to have to pay the price for whatever you do or whatever happens to you. It's a price to pay. And in prison, people don't realize, say, if you get into a real physical confrontation, you're going to be punished for that, you know what I'm saying? And you may get beat by the police yourself. You know, you you definitely going in the lockup. And when I say lockup, that means you going in a cell, like I just explained to you, with nothing in there but a mattress and a sheet. And you may be in there for months and sometimes even years. So just imagine locking yourself in your own bathroom and eating in there and just sleeping in there and just staying in there for a year, two years, three years, five months, six months. That's what you have to go through. So 
when you come to the breaking point where you're going to be in confrontation, you got to factor all of this in. So a lot of times you try to avoid that confrontation, and that's what I was trying to do. But obviously he didn't care about that. He just had a, such a disgust and dislike for me that he just kept coming at me and coming at me. And we had a mutual friend, and the mutual friend was telling them that I wasn't the dude to be messing with. But he didn't care. He just kept pushing and he kept pushing. So finally, uh, it came to a head after it had been going on for maybe a month or so. And he uh, he threatened me. You know, he told me that he was going to end up killing me. He said he can feel it. And he said, man, you can make me end up killing you. And in prison, I assume anywhere in life, but more so in prison, you can't take those type of threats lightly because he was already in there for murder. Now, I don't know the circumstances because a lot of people can be charged for murder, but you don't know the circumstances, you know? And you could be charged with something that you didn't actually do. People don't know that, but that's that's just facts. So, in there though, you can assume that if he charged for murder, that, you know, he probably, you know, will kill or have killed. So, yeah, I took that serious. So, you know, we ended up in a confrontation where, uh, he ended up getting stabbed, you know, and it was either going to be me or him, and it just ended up being him. He almost lost his life behind that incident, and I had to pay a hell of a price for that incident as well because it's like I told you, you get locked up. I was facing more time, which that was almost irrelevant considering the amount of time that I had, but... If he had died or something like that, then I could have possibly been facing the electric chair, you know. So those are confrontations that you always want to avoid, but at the same time, it could also be flipped around on you. I could have been dead. I could have been laying in there fighting for my life. It all, it all depends on who going to do what and when they're going to do it. And you don't know if someone is just talking or you don't know if they're serious. But if you wait around to find out, that could cost you your life. You know, that can cost you your life in there. So you have to do what you have to do when you feel you have to do it because you ain't got but one life and ain't nobody going to get that back to you. So that was my mentality. And I felt like if he was going to try to hurt me, I was going to try to hurt him. If he was going to try to kill me, I was going to try to kill him. You know, and I had made it up in my mind in there. I know I'm not invincible. I know I can die. But if I did die in there, I was going to try to make sure someone died with me. You know, so... That confrontation right there really uh, caused me to lose a lot. And thankfully he didn't die, but he definitely uh, uh, <laughs> survived and came to court and testified on me and tried to get me some more time. But, you know, thank God I didn't get more time because, you know, it was explained that I was not the aggressor, that I didn't start the confrontation or whatnot. So I came out of that, but I did lose some because you lose some every time you get in a confrontation like that. I stayed in isolation, which they call the hole, for probably about 17, 18 months. 17, 18 months in a cell by myself, no one to talk to, no companionship, no anything. Eat in there, sleep in there, use the bathroom in there, wake up every day, do the same thing, lay back in the bunk. And you ain't getting out until they say you're getting out. And you don't know when that is. You know, so that's what I went through. And um, that confrontation right there taught me a lot. And I learned a lot from it. But, you know, like I said, I can look at it a thousand ways. And it's always going to come back to the same thing. It's either going to be my life or his life. And I'm always going to choose my life. You know, so, yeah, that was, that was an experience for me. One of the first ones, violent ones of a couple of more, but that was the first real violent incident I got into while I was in prison. How long had you been in prison by the time this took place? Oh, man, I hadn't even been in there, but I think I was right on three years, three and a half years, three and a half years. But it's crazy to say this, but it's, it's true. That incident alone may have saved me from multiple incidents multiple incidents and what I mean by that is once it's known like I say that you will be violent and you will be violent to to the point where as to you'll do anything to make sure you don't get hurt once people know that then they're 
more reluctant to even start anything with you. So by me just coming into prison and me only being in there for a short amount of time, for them to know that I would go to that length, it may have saved me a whole lot of drama than I'm, I'm sure it did, you know. I ended up in more confrontations later on down the line, but that right there alone went a long way with me because they always remember that. And it's, it's in prison, they got like, like a prison pipeline. Something happens, and especially if it's something of that nature, it, it can travel from prison to prison. I mean, just like that. Because somebody getting moved, they're getting transferred, or they'll say, oh, such and such got stabbed on this compound. Who did it? Such and such and such. So your name will be known for doing these type of things. And once your name gets known for doing these type of things, so when people run across you, even if they don't know you, they know your name. So opposed to trying to run game on you, opposed to trying to run con on you, opposed to trying to take advantage of you, if they know your name, that resonates with them. And they say, oh, he did such and such, oh, I ain't going to mess with him. So it may have saved me a lot in the long run, but it cost me a lot at that time. You got to balance it out. You got to see what you want to do. Because like I said, if I had not have done it, it could have been me, you know? And if it, if it would have been me, would I would have survived? Who knows, you know? So you just have to do what you have to do at that moment. You got to use your best judgment to protect your life, you know? And that's what I did. You know, Banky, when you share these type of things with us, these are things that happened, you know, so long ago. You know, does this at all almost seem like it's unreal? Does it seem like a dream at all? Like, talk to me about what it's like to relive some of these crazier moments from all of this time that you've done. Yeah, it, it does feel like that a lot of times. It do feel like a dream. Sometimes I look back, and, and especially since I've been out, I look back at some of the things I went through, some of the things I experienced, and I say to myself, man, did I actually go through that? You know, did I actually make it through that? You know, and it's surreal. It is, especially, like I say, when you get out here and you're in the free world and you're living this type of life that you're living right now where you ain't, you ain't got to live like that, you know, it makes you appreciate life a lot more. And, you know, it, it, it does make you look back and say, well, damn, man, I lived a crazy life. But that's the type of life you had to live if you wanted to survive. Because trust me, I know a lot of people, man, and I say a lot, double digits, that, that went into prison with me or came in when I was in there, that did not make it out. Did not make it out. And some that made it out, then they still ain't out because they lost their mind. You know, which is very easy to lose in there. You lose it just like that. You know, you lose focus just like that, and, and your mind is gone, and you can't get it back. You got some dudes that is, they, they stress it so much, they put them on medication, and they put them on medication, and they never the same. Never the same. So I was always scared to get to that point where they try to put me on medication or try to force me on medication. So I always tried to stay focused, man, and it's hard to do in there sometimes. So it's crazy because, like I, I was telling you earlier uh, on the way to the interview, man, I still st stay in touch with dudes that's in prison. And I just found out just a dude that I just left less than a year ago, 37 years old, getting ready to get out. They found him dead last week, you know, in the shower. So that's that's just crazy. But it's, 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 it's a life that happens all the time in prison. But people don't know that, people don't see that, and a lot of people out here don't even care. You know what I'm saying? They don't care until it's someone you love. They don't care until it's someone you know, you know? But this is life every day in prison. Every day stuff like that happens, you know what I'm saying? But people don't know about it. But I bet his family know, I bet his family feel it, I bet they hurt and I bet they grieving. You know what I'm saying? And they, it seems to think that people would think, well, everybody in prison, they, they, you know what I'm saying? They did something to get in there, so that's that's what happens to them. Well, everybody do something. Everybody do something. You know what I'm saying? But you got to get to the point where you have some type of level of compa compassion, some type of level of understanding that anybody can be in any situation today, tomorrow, the next five minutes. You know. And when there's somebody that you love and there's somebody that you care about, then that would change your whole perception of how you look at a situation. You look at a situation from one angle, you're only gonna see one angle. But it's several angles to every situation. And you don't know the backstory. You are never what 
somebody say you are. They say, oh, well, he's a murderer, or, or he's, a, he's a cop, or, or he's a racist, or he's whatever. And you just take that title that someone else told you what someone was, and you go on that, and you judge a person for that, then you don't know what somebody's saying about you. You don't know what somebody's judging you from. Unless you know a person and know their whole story and their backstory, if you don't take time to listen, then you don't understand that person and you don't know that person. You know, so I, it took me a long time to understand that. A long time, you know what I'm saying, to have better understanding of that, that everybody is not what their title are. You know, everybody is not what other people say they are. I told you today, I judge you from what you are to me. My experience, which is the greatest teacher on earth, nothing is going to be like your experience. Nobody's knowledge is greater than their experience. I can tell you what something is like all day long, but until you experience it, you would not fully understand it. You have to experience something to understand it. So I don't judge people by what other people say they are. And like I say, to come through that experience like that, man, and to be out here on the other side, it's a beautiful thing. But I know a lot of people that didn't make it, a whole lot of them. So I thank God that I did make it, you know, and all the prayers and the people that love me and wanted me out here, man. I, I'm out here and I just don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to disappoint myself. I don't want to disappoint my kids. And I'm not going to do any of those things because I believe in me first. You know what I'm saying? I believe in me first and I know what my potential is, you know. So I'm just grateful, man. I'm just real grateful, man. And I'm happy to be out here, man. And I'm just glad I made it out here, you know. And that's why I don't complain. You know, I want to switch gears a little bit. Let's fast forward to where we are today. And to think about what you were initially sentenced to, two life sentences plus 100 years, something in that ballpark? 115. Banky, how did you end up getting another chance at life? There's people who are probably hearing this amount of time that you were sentenced to and are thinking to themselves the same exact thing. When I got locked up um, back in the 80s, man, it was, uh, I think it was, I think you did like a certain percentage of your time. I'm not exactly sure what it is. I know they changed the law in the um, mid 90s. I think it was 65% of your yeah, time. Yeah, you did 65% back then. So if you had a life sentence for real back then, you, 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 you were supposed to start going up for parole within 12 years. And any time after that, you was eligible to make parole. Chances that you wasn't going to make it, you know. I've heard of people who have did 18, 20, 25 years and made it, stuff like that. So, it, you know, you can make parole when you have life sentences, but Virginia had the lowest parole rate in the country for multiple years, at least all the years I was in prison. I'm talking about they had like 2% that they get parole to. Anybody had life sentence opposed to them. North Carolina, New York, or anywhere else did way less time than Virginia did. So it's not inconceivable for someone to get out with two life sentences, three life sentences. I know dudes that have got out in less time than I have with four life sentences, five life sentences, six life sentences, and did less time than I did. So it's possible. It's very possible. I got out because I changed my whole way of thinking, you know. I changed my entire way of thinking and I started to be proactive in getting out of prison. I started to create programs that were self-help programs. Uh, I called them uh, CMC programs. It was Cognizant Motivational Counseling. You know, something that I had experience in, something that I knew about that I could tell a young dude that was coming into prison and motivate him and counsel him about pitfalls that I went through during this time so that they wouldn't go through them as well while they was just coming into prison. And I created that whole format and it was called Rehab was the first program that I created. And it stood for reevaluating habits and behavior. And they liked it, the program. The administration liked the program. The warden liked the program, the major liked the program. These are the major people on the prison. So that helped me to get on a positive side opposed to on the negative side. 
And when I started doing that, I started feeling better about myself. I started feeling like I was part of the solution and I was helping somebody else, which I did not know that that would facilitate in helping me getting out because still, you know, I know dudes had it, who had did that already too and still hadn't went nowhere. Dudes had been doing it for years and still hadn't went nowhere. So I more so started doing it for, to actually help the younger dudes. And it just ended up helping me as well because the warden liked it so much that he started championing my cause. You know, he started asking me, well, how long you been locked up or how long it is for you go back up for parole? And he just told me one day, he was like, um, well, the next time you go up for parole, man, I'm going to go speak up for you, you know. And I was kind of shocked that he said it. And I didn't, to be honest, I didn't know if I believed him or not, but he said it. So true enough, when I did go up for parole, he went and spoke up for me, you know. Now, I didn't make it that time, but he also doubled back and told me, well, if I'm here next year and you go up again because you go up every year, and he said, if I'm here next year, I'll go up for you again, man, and we're going to try to get your program implemented in this in this system, man, because I like it, because it's it's a counseling program, and it's, and it's hands-on, and I like it. And it's it's different because you're not just using a facilitator or a teacher or a psychologist or a or, 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 or psychiatrist or something to teach a class and to try to drive this damn people through. People are more apt to listen to people like them and been through something that they know they got to go through than it is to listen to a teacher. So this is why they liked it, the program. So he championed my cause, man, and he uh, he probably was a major part of me getting out as well with all the support that I had from my family and people from the outside who had loved me, had been supporting me for years. They championed my cause for years, and they just picked up the pace, and, you know, it just snowballed and snowballed where I had so much support that if they would not have let me out, they would have probably had to have a good reason. Because along with all the support that I had, my my institutional record warned me having a, a, another chance. Because all of the trouble and the drama that I had went through within my 33 years had subsided, where I wasn't even getting in that type of trouble no more for probably the last decade I was in there. Because like I say, once you establish yourself, you're not gonna have that much drama. You're not gonna have that much trouble because people know who you are and they know what comes with, with, with messing with you. They know what comes with, you know what I'm saying, trying to run game on you or trying to run con on you or trying to oppose you for anything. They know what comes with that. So you will have less drama for us within the convicts. Now the drama that you may have with the institution is a whole nother animal because they're gonna do what they wanna do to you whenever they wanna do it to you just because they can. But as far as with the convict side, I had no problems, no issues. So that stopped me from getting into trouble or getting more charges or to being that reckless as I used to be. So now that my institutional record warned that they saw a change in me, I had that going for me with my family going to bat for me. And now I got the warden going to bat for me and, and I got people within the administration are going to bat for me. And if you still deny me, then it's not about me. It's not about how much time I did. It's something else, you know. And it came down to that. And, and, and um, when I got the answer that I made parole, man, it was just, uh, I mean, it was, I can't even explain it. It was, it was just unbelievable. And when you usually get that answer, you usually get it from uh, your counselor. And... <laughs> I've went to see my counselor so many times to get the answer, and it always was the same. Denied, denied, denied. So to finally get it, and it has on there, it usually say denied, denied, and had on there, granted. To see that, I had to read it two or three times. I just couldn't even believe it. And I didn't even get it from my counselor. I actually got it from the warden who had uh, championed my cause. I got it from him. He called me over to his office, and he gave it to me himself, you know. And he actually, <laughs> he actually made a joke about it. He called me over there and he was like, uh, and usually when you get called to the warden office, man, you that's not a good thing. But he called me over there and he was like, um, have a seat. 
And uh, I was like, what's up? And he was, he said, uh, did you hear anything about your parole yet? And I was like, nah. And he was like, I'm sorry to tell you, you didn't make it. And I was like, what? He was like, I'm sorry to tell you, you didn't make it. I said, all right. And that's news that you hear all the time, but it's, it's still like a dagger in the heart. But I had heard it so many times, you know, you used to it. But like I said, it's still hard to swallow. And then he waited for about five seconds and he said, uh, he literally said, I don't even know if I can say this, but he literally said, nah, man, I'm just f***ing with you, man. You made it. And, man, I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, you made it. And he held up the paper and I looked at him and I was like, are you serious? He said, yeah. I said, you are serious? He said, yeah, read it yourself. And he let me read it, man. And I just looked at it and I read it and I, I tried to look at my name and look at my number to make sure it was me. To be sure this is this is me. Like this is not a joke. This is for real. And he was like, Yeah, it's it's for real, man. He said, I just wanted to give you the news myself, man. And like I said, you can go up for parole all them times, which I had, and get turned down and get turned down. And it's it's the same news and it's bad news, but you you you, you kinda expect it after a while. But when you get that good news and it's that's life changing news, that changed my whole life. You know, it changed my whole life, and I walked back to the building, which is a, uh, which is a good walk from where I was. And the whole time I'm walking, man, it was like, it was like I was dreaming. And I kept feeling my pocket for the paper to make sure it was real. And I kept looking at it, pulling it out, looking at it, and I was like, walking back, and I was like, is this real? I mean, are they really gonna, you know, let me out? You know, when I went back and the first thing I did was call my mother, man. I called my mother and um, like I had shared with y'all when I first got out and got in the car with my mother, but when I called my mother, she was actually in a funeral and she answered the phone and um, she was like, well, I can't talk right now. I'm in a funeral. Are you all right? What's wrong? I said, I said, mom, could you please step outside? She said, uh. I'm in a funeral. I said, could you please step outside? She said, are you all right? I said, please just go outside. And um, she went outside. She said, hold on. And she go outside and I'm sitting in there. And I'm literally trying not to cry because, you know, you got all these convicts behind you and you, you know, that's just another thing in prison too. You know, you don't want to be crying. If they don't know what the situation is. They probably think you're on the phone crying over a girl or whatnot. So it's just something that, that this, that you don't do in there, but it was hard. It was it was difficult. It was an emotional uh, it was an emotional experience. So when she get outside and she get on the phone and she was like, "What's wrong?" And I said, "Ma, I made parole." And man, I can hear her scream right now. She just scream and start just saying, "Hallelujah, Hallelujah!" I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And that just that just made me start crying. You know, and I was just crying, and she was crying, and it's just, it's a, it's an experience, man. Like, I can talk about it now, and it'll make me emotional, because that was greater feeling than him actually telling me I made parole. It was a greater feeling, man. And then I, I, I finished the call with her, and I called my daughter, and I got the exact same reaction. The exact same reaction, so... Yeah, I had to go in the cell, man, and just close the door and cover it up and get in there and pray and cry to myself and just pinch myself and ask myself, was it really real, man? But And it was. For the first time after three decades, someone was telling me that you get another chance at life, you know. And I had just told my mother and I had just told my daughter. And that just was the greatest feeling in the world. Greatest feeling in the world.